guys, welcome back to the channel. This week doing a video on the Gateshead uh, Keyside Arena. So I'm going to start with the usual sort of talk through the site history, go through sort of the other arenas in Newcastle. And this site has had a number of proposals as well, so I'm going to talk through some of them. And then finally show you the sort of the latest proposal, any sort of contentions and issues that came with this. As with anything in planning, there's always some controversy. The site history of this site, um, I'll show you now on a top-down view. It's located between the Baltic flour mill and the Sage Gateshead. This site was always a very industrial site. With it was the river was the main uh, mode of transport for Newcastle and Gateshead to sort of bring shipments in and get them out. This area always had a very industrial heritage to it, as you can imagine, that it being the main transport route. The industries that needed but to be close to this river for the transport reasons were built there. So in the 1860s, if you look at this historic map beside the Gateshead, this area was not fully developed and um, there are lots of vacant sites between it, but the main things on it were a timber yard and an iron warehouse. This industrial presence was there at this point. This was later grown upon by 1940. The main thing taken at the site was the uh, rope works. I believe this was for British ropes. And this took up a considerable portion of the site, which now lies partly where the sage is and partly where this vacant site is. And obviously by this time, the Baltic flour mills, which still is retained to this day, was constructed. So as you can see, this area was very industrial with a number of engineering works also surrounding the site. With the deindustrialization that happened in the United Kingdom, these uses ended up um, disappearing from this area with British rope works closing the site being cleared completely. Whilst on the north side of the river, the Tynaway Development Corporation did massive amounts of regeneration during the 1990s, making the East Quayside development, which I've got a video about here. The area of Gateshead was never part of the Tynaway Development Corporation's area. This south side of the river was never had that widespread regeneration from this development corporation as Newcastle site did. So it became a very different approach that's been taken. But it's important to sort of consider this site, which is now vacant, has been proposed as a use for a sort of an arena and a conference centre for a number of decades and obviously nothing is still yet to be built. So if we look at the other arenas in Newcastle, my previous video covered the Metro Radio Arena or whatever brand has got its name now. This arena was built in the 1990s, so it's very, very new for a building this size. The Metro Radio Arena does form the largest uh, arena within Newcastle and Gateshead area, but its its location, whilst being close to the train station, is just next to its obviously massive vacant site. And I think the proposal is to bring this to a more central location and what they consider more city centre than what the Metro Radio Arena is considered. The other proposal that always needs to be talked about when you're trying to build an arena down the quayside is the Time Deck, just because this is just a fascinating um, just piece of modernist plan and they tried to come up with. And this was when they, um, they had the bright idea of building a, what can almost be described as a plateau across the Tart River Time. And this would have hosted a sort of arena conference center just downstream of the Time Bridge, sort of where the Sage and the site is located now. And this would have symbolically and physically connected Newcastle and Gateshead into sort of one, just one, unitary place, which a really interesting proposal and I think it really shows the ideals of the time. Luckily, this was never built. There's no horrible plateau of hidden river that runs through Newcastle and Gateshead, but it's important to consider with this when you think about any new proposals of, of what crazy ideas have been in the past, I think it's important to consider what you're getting now. Following on from this, as I said, this site has had a number of proposals that have been um, shown at the time. I think for the past 20 years they've wanted some form of arena on this site. So these plans were to build a £30 million conference centre that sort of joined the Sage Gateshead. So this proposal never really had any formal plans, it had some artistic impressions that were delivered um, and these sort of show a, a site interlinks between the Baltic and Sage, offers the venue of a conference centre and the venue of an arena. But this sort of really set the precedent for the site of what was going to be built here. But this proposal was later scrapped as an in-house study revealed that borrowing costs would actually outweigh any future benefits of the scheme. Say they um, decided this whole scheme would be inviolable on the site 
and this decision was made by Gated Council and the North Music Trust that this whole um, the conditions were not right at this time to build this complex. That's a very interesting thing and that really set the precedent for the site to be used for such a significant use in 2013. So there we have the site laying dormant ever since with no real plans coming to fruition for a number of years. I think Gateshead Council was always very adamant on uh, building on this site for such a significant use. Gateshead Council and the majority landowner here, that I think believe they own the whole site. So there's no issues of a private developer coming on with some lousy scheme. They have complete control and complete power of what they want to build here. So then the next thing we really hear is in 2017 is when architects Hock, that's H-O-K, don't know if it's pronounced Hock or said Hock, who are renowned for top sporting and hotel developments were appointed to design the $200 million conference center. But the interesting thing here is that this is, Hock was one of three companies appointed by Gateshead Council. The idea of appointing three different um, architecture offices is something that I think you'll see when the controversy of the scheme comes out and might be linked to sort of why the design looks the way it does. So then the next real major announcement we get is a render is released of this Gateshead Keyside scheme. The first one you see is this top-down render. Uh, it's a nighttime render which as with any um, major film or anything when they're doing a nighttime render it means what they've designed doesn't look that good so we, we receive this nighttime render of the scheme and as you can see it's lit up really nicely and it shows connecting in with the millennium bridge uh connecting the sage and the baltic and sort of creating this huge huge new uh, public space but the really interesting parts of this design is really it's trying to incorporate so much that it just has lots of different elements jutting out and as this top-down render, you can't really tell much. You'll never see this from a top-down perspective unless you're doing a helicopter tour of the city. So whilst this is, yeah, it's great to see, to while up people's anticipation, it doesn't really show the perceptions of how this place will actually look. So the following render was a much lower angle, which shows the different elements of this proposal really sticking out. So the Baltic uh, flour mills was luckily saved from demolition like a number of other flour mills that are lost at this um, after deindustrialization, and this was obviously converted into an art gallery. So this is a really historic Art Deco building, it's a real monument on the Gateshead Quayside, a really just high quality design. And what they did with the renovations of it was a sort of a pop art style with the glass view index, the restaurant on top. It are really impressive. And then obviously to the west of the site as well, it's the Sage Gateshead, which um, was an international design competition was held to sort of design this um, music arts complex and that's why it has such a striking design. So there's two real icons either side of the scheme which really makes whatever filled this gap really has to transition between a real brick art deco structure and then the glass modern of Sage. So it's quite a, a transition, it has to be quite a transitional structure. What was proposed though is where the controversy really lies because you've got so many elements coming in. There's a hotel, there's an arena, and I believe they're trying to bring in just sort of public uses. I think some restaurants and bars and that sort of thing within this space as well. But this structure looks like each of its individual elements are just slapped on. Like they're molded out of clay, like, oh, we'll shove a hotel here, we'll shove the arena at the back. It doesn't really flow as a structure. And the, the real significant point of this is this blue, often described, Lego-looking hotel tower that just stands out of the whole structure and looks almost like Trinity Square and Gates all over again with their massive blobs that doesn't really look good. And as I said, these two amazing structures either side of it really warrants some really high quality design. But what, what was proposed here just doesn't really stand the test of how important this plot is to time size. This is one of the most significant sites on Tyneside and it needs to be a striking structure to really capture, needs to capture the amazing East Quayside development, the Baltic, the Sage, and the striking Millennium Bridge. It's just an area for really high quality design. So if something's not stacking up to that, it really stands out badly. And this is what this proposal does. Um, there's a number of bashing articles online. I believe The Guardian did a bashing article online about this, how it just didn't really hold up to what the site was. There were also further concerns with this hotel block um, 
would block the natural light from the Baltic uh, key apartments. So these apartments stand behind the Baltic around, I think they're built around the 2000s. They're, they're an alright design, they're nothing too striking, I think they look fairly modern, they're quite nice. But this hotel would block some um, of the views and daylight and sunlight of these apartment schemes. I don't think this would be detrimental. Um, I think if you're buying an apartment in this place, this site was always going to be developed. It's unfortunate the hotel tower block was put so close to apartments. But if you're buying a site in, the, in a major regeneration scheme, these are the factors that you might have to come across. Another part of the scheme which is um, quite striking is the over-reliance on car parking. Gateshead Quayside is not well connected by the Tynaway Metro because this sort of bypassed the whole area as when this was constructed the quayside was just a derelict area, therefore no metro station really serves this. Luckily the Keeling bus does serve this area. As of East Quayside there seems to be an over-reliance on to make these places successful on putting car park in here. So I believe they're putting a 10-storey car park in this location, which this car park must be one of the tallest non-residential structures in the whole of Gateshead, being 10 storeys tall. And it really sets that if anything else wants to be built behind, it has to be built taller than 10 storeys tall to really see over, which is just very strange. They're also trying to claim this um, car park is carbon neutral, which I find claims like this just out outlandish and just it just undermines so much about environmentalism and planning. A car park made out of concrete and steel construction, to me, cannot be carbon neutral. You're, there's carbon released from the concrete curing process. The main mode of transport linking with this car park, there are EV charges in the basement and there's solar panels on the roof. But the transport emissions of everyone driving to the site, I don't think you can claim something like a car park can ever be carbon neutral due to this, the factors just listed. And also the Guardian in their article try and claim that um, Gates had tried to slip this um, proposal, this hideous proposal through during the COVID-19 pandemic when public consultation was no longer be able to held in person and everything was online. So yeah, it's really interesting the design they eventually came up with for such a significant site. And it, and it seems like this site is going through. They, um, they closed the car parks just after Christmas to do some ground testing works. I would love to see something built on this site, don't get me wrong, this site needs to be developed. This would really link in with Gate, what Gateshead Council has been doing with their piecemeal improvements to the quayside. With a design like this, I just don't think it stands up to the significance of the site and the significance of Newcastle's quayside. A place full of such iconic architecture on both sides of the river that throwing in something like this in the middle just doesn't really work for it. So yeah, please let me know what you think about this whole scheme. Uh, this is not trying to be a comprehensive history of the site, this is more of talk about the design, talk about the site and its significance and, and what's really gone on here and why this site should be mo so much more than it is with these current proposals. But yeah, thanks for watching and um, yeah, tune in next time.